Hello and welcome to the Stateside Soccer Show. My name is Jordan Wiggin and I am broadcasting from the studio that John Strong and uh, Stu Holden were in, the basement of Fox. Just don't mind the wrinkles I have here on the DoorDash sponsor. And with me today is a man who is uh, sweating like crazy, Logan Stump. Yeah, uh, I don't know if that's a way to introduce myself because they're probably like, why is he sweating? That's weird. Um, does well, he tell the story. Me? Tell the He's story. Yeah, so uh, Saturday before we're heading off to the Orlando City game, I'm sitting there. It's 3 o'clock, I believe, around 4, 4.30 because we're going to go grab a bite to eat before heading downtown for the game. And we were sitting there. I'm like, it is extremely warm in this uh, house. Why is it warm? I'm usually not sweating when I'm sitting on the couch. Um, and and I was not watching cops uh, like stepbrothers would assume you do. Um, but it, it really was like 80 in our house. And I was like, why is it so warm? Got up, the air conditioner froze, and it, it was clogged. So we think we fixed it. But, man, you, you need AC in the south. I know a bunch of you northerners, Jordan, you probably don't understand air, air conditioning very well. But... Um, no, we do. I mean, uh, I'll tell you, we don't understand it in February, but we, we understand true. it in the summer. I'll tell you that much. That's true. But, but yeah. yeah, I mean, we, uh, I, I would have killed for some of that heat on, uh, the, in the, on Saturday during the union game. That thing was, it was cold. It was really, really cold. Uh, but Jordan, we're here. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I didn't get an invite, um, to the studio and I just assume now that it's, it's basically because you're better than me. Like, I, I just assume that with everything that you've accomplished in the last couple of days, that you, you've ultimately taken that next step. And you kind That's of you, why you, they put me down here. Yeah. You warned me. You, you told me that, like, every time you open a show, you're like, Logan's really, you know, he's talking to, to different coaches and the coach are getting involved. <laughs> his parents are getting involved and texting me. And, like, yeah, I just, I just feel like you, you've now taken that next step. You, you've arrived. I have arrived. Yeah, no, I, I went to my first match as a credentialed member of the media, as we are. We are media members, loosely. And uh, <laughs> we uh, I went there. So I went to the Union game, watched the crew and the Union, and, and I was up in the press box. I got to do the uh, press conference afterwards. We have some clips from that as well that I'll share as we go on. But it was freezing. It was cold. Now it was warmer in the press box, I think, than than like in the stands because we at least had a back uh, and some sides to us. Only the front is opened. So, uh, but I was still wearing like my beanie. I had my big puffy jacket on. It was it was cold. It was like under thirty degrees by the time that it kicked off. So it was uh, it was it was a cold one. I'll, I'll tell you that much. But. Yeah, so we're here to share our overreactions, our thoughts on week one here. So obviously, Union, our class of the East, Seattle is the best in the West. We have uh, Austin's in huge trouble. St. Louis is turning out pretty good. We got huge overreact. Chicago Fire didn't lose a game. So we are in a good spot for some of these teams. <laughs> wait, wait. What did you say? The Chicago Fire didn't lose? That was a stray yeah. again, Jordan, a stray. Yeah, they did not lose. Uh, they didn't play. Uh, so we'll see. So we are at where so far five clubs have yet to start their campaign. We are recording Monday at 7 o'clock. If you're listening to the podcast feed, we're live. But. Uh, 7 o'clock Eastern Time, Monday evening, which means in three hours, the next game is going to kick off. This was one of the ones I picked for match of the week. Uh, It got moved due to the weather from yesterday to today, and it is Portland hosting Sporting Kansas City. We also have the Galaxy and LAFC, which have not played. Um, That was one of my other picks, right? Uh, We haven't had an episode since then. What happened on that is the weather was bad, but they were more worried about thunderstorms. I know people were saying how soft they were for canceling to the rain at the Rose bowl. There's not enough coverage. And with thunder and lightning storms, they were worried that uh, everybody was in jeopardy. The the players, the fans, 90,000, however many people they expected, there was not enough coverage to be able to take cover in a lightning storm. So that was an issue for the Rose Bowl. That got moved to July 4th. And the Fire have not started play yet because of the uneven number of teams. 
So that's where we currently stand. So what we'll go over today, we'll go over the games that happened. We'll talk about Apple TV broadcasts, what we thought. And then we won't preview the matches for next week. We're going to do that either midweek or like Friday, somewhere around there. We're going to do a uh, episode that is going to cover tonight's game and the uh, look ahead to the following week. Because we think this episode is going to be pretty long with, with how much stuff we have to talk about. I also want to highlight Kai Kamara is landing at the fire. So he had the week off still. Uh, he had his trade requested, so uh, it was granted. He is now on the Chicago Fire. And, hey, this season started with no draws. Pretty good. We'll see if that trend continues tonight. And then uh, I also just wanted to quickly say as well that this was the first time that they've had two games with over 65,000 in attendance. Charlotte had 67, and Atlanta had 65-plus. There. So, hey, you know, the South is turning out all right. I remember when people thought that the South was not going to be a spot for soccer due to the college football, the, you know, how much they take football seriously down there. But Logan, the South is thriving. Yeah, as a as a representative of the South, uh, I'd like to come on and say we lost the war, but we're winning the fight, right? Um, and by the war, I mean the Civil War. Uh, glad they lost, but uh, no, the South looks good, Jordan. Uh, I think that they are finally starting to realize that these cities can be hotbeds for, um, and not just the literal sense and the figurative sense, hotbeds for good soccer. Like, I, I really do think that you get some of your best uh, college soccer too, uh, Midwest and in the South, like you're, you're starting to kind of see some of these teams like Duke, North Carolina produce good soccer teams. And I, I think too, Atlanta being a huge market now and with the, with Atlanta United starting to look like they're, you know, turning on its head and kind of playing a little bit better. I think that that's a massive market. Uh, and if, if the South buys in Jordan, I think that this game just propels to a next level uh, because the Northeast already is bought in. I think the Midwest is pretty much bought in on soccer. The West Coast, I, I would say, is probably our best markets uh, as far as like San Diego, Los Angeles. Uh, even if you can lump in Austin uh, with the West, uh, you would you would have some of our best TV markets for sports. And then you throw in Seattle and Portland. You've got some of the best fan bases in the league. But the South is slowly but surely coming along. I think uh, 69,000 or something crazy, right, with uh, Charlotte and something nuts, um, upwards of 60-some thousand. That, I've never seen the stadium that full, Jordan, for the Carolina Panthers. And I have uh, been around that market for a very long time, watching it from a distance because all of my friends were Carolina Panther fans. Never once has that Bank of America stadium been uh, as crowded as it was. Yeah, it's, it's crazy how well th this is um, going uh, for, for some of these Southern teams. Now, again, this is where – they're going to have to Charlotte is going to have to hopefully produce at a certain point uh, to keep those fans right right now. It's hot because it's new and you know, you gotta be able to latch on to that. Now there are signs that you can like the union were hot. Maybe the first year um, where people were checking them out. And then we kind of went a while without, winning or doing anything well and then now that we're a good team again the stadium's packed and, and they've been there for now 13 years so it shows that you can also like kind of recapture that attention but um it's just nice when you can continue the momentum as uh as well so let's talk about the apple tv product before we you know mls season pass before we move on to the actual content of the matches but uh, now I was up in the press box, so they had it on the TV, but it was 40 seconds behind uh, the live action, which is understandable. So, uh, But they didn't have the sound on that either, so I couldn't really hear some of that stuff. What I did notice and what I noticed a lot of other people say is lack of replays. That, that kind of replays took a bit to get in and that they didn't go to as many replays Um so that's probably an issue because like there was, you know, a time where I'm looking up and I'm hoping to see a replay of something and they didn't like the handballs. There's two handball calls in the union game and they didn't really show them that much, which is unfortunate. I, now, again, I think that stuff will get kind of ironed out as we go. So I'm not too, I'm not too worried about that, but yeah, that, that is uh, something that I noticed 
as well here. But uh, when I got home, I watched uh, the rest of the Vancouver game um, and then transitioned to watching MLS wrap up, which went until about 1 30 PM at uh, 1 30 AM Eastern time, which Logan is brand new for us. Uh, when there are how many times would we watch a game on Fox? And as soon as it ends, they don't even do like a wrap up. They're like, well, that's us. We're going o- over to this college basketball game. We'll see you later. And that was it. And then uh, ESPN plus would just say this event has ended. Uh, you know, we had full on coverage. It was like turning on the NFL network after a match where you're able to sit there and watch them talk about it for hours. And I was able to watch uh, highlights again of games I missed while I was gone. I was able to hear them talk about games. It was, I don't know. It, it was just great that it, they kept rolling. I, I was kind of shocked that they were going for one thirty because the game uh, ended around 12 ish 12 30 maybe but so they went an extra hour after the la- end of the last game yeah and i was thinking about this in the car uh, and i was listening to extra time on the way over and weebies on there doyle was in the green room um and they were talking about it and they said that it just had a different kind of energy where like it finally feels like this is a major league product is what i think doyle compared it to it's like a major league product of a product that we can be proud of there's nothing really like this if you look around i would say that nbc with the premier league is the closest thing that and i would say even more so that mls knocked their coverage out of the park um yes there's some things that they'll get there's some chemistry issues i think i think there's some Uh, hiccups obviously with some of the new stuff but you didn't really notice the hiccups i think the hiccups are more of like you know things they need to add and and that's something that they'll get better at it's something that they're just not they're not used to doing yet i don't think the producers are used to producing the product for mls how it usually rolls mls is a fast moving league uh unlike i think the premier league the premier league sees a lot more stoppage time than the mls does usually um so it, it is interesting to kind of see this product jordan because when i look around i i think about all these other sports right I think about some of our favorite networks, like my my Cubs are on Marquee Network, uh, which you don't really get. It's not really a thing you get. It's just you, if you're in the Chicago area, you do get Marquee Network, but then you have to pay extra for the league pass and stuff like that. I'm thinking about the NBA. TNT does a nice thing before the game, pregame with Charles and then halftime and then to wrap the night up. But there's nothing like this wall to wall coverage of like. I, Jordan, I've never sat there and actually had somebody talking MLS for hours on end. Like it just doesn't happen. And it was so exciting to see it's coverage that I don't think exists in any of the other leagues in the American sports. And I think it's brilliant. Like, I, I think it's absolutely fantastic. The sets are beautiful. Um, they went simple and absolutely knocked out of the park. But again, we're looking at Apple, right? Think about all the Apple products you own. They're pretty flawless, right? We've got our complaints about some, but I mean, just pretty... the phone is all. I yeah, have, so. right. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've got all of it. I've got the iPad. I've got the computer. I've got the. I've got everything. I don't have the AirPods, but everything I've ever gotten from Apple does not disappoint. And I'm always happy with my Apple products. And I think that's the way that this league is going. And I think the thing that helps Jordan is they're trying to get NFL enticed, and they're going to spend a lot of money to do so. And this product and this quality of product is going to be fantastic. Yeah, the. Uh, the broadcast clarity was great. The set design looked great compared to Fox and ESPN. I mean, literally, Fox. <laughs> this is a joke behind me. If but it's not really. This, if people didn't see this, it was a joke when it really happened too. But if you're an audio listener, I literally just changed my green screen to a wrinkled DoorDash thing, and this is in reference to the so the game that was the first game of the week, Nashville NYCFC was also on Fox, Big Fox, by the way. And this is what they were broadcasting in front of. It was like they really pulled a DoorDash ad out of a box and they like unfolded it, put it on some rig, and had John Strong and Stu Holden huddled up next to it. Like, yes, guys, this is where we're broadcasting from. So here's the thing. Fox w- was putting this game on Big Fox. They don't send their people to cover the game live. They have they couldn't even have the good set behind them. They used to have like the set where like there's people working in the background and they yeah, kind of just room. chill in yep. here like a newsroom type thing. They couldn't even do that. They couldn't even use 
Alexi's State of the Union set for his podcast, which looks much better than a darn DoorDash ad. I don't know why they didn't just take the feed from Apple. Take the pre like take the pregame, take the announcers. They would have to do less work. They wouldn't even have to pay John Strong and, and Stu Holden to be there. But here's the thing. They are probably under contract with them, and they don't have any other competitions except for World Cups going on right now. So they have to give them something to do, I guess, is their thought. But I just kind of thought like, oh, they would just put on the Apple feed, you know? And when you look at the Apple set, it looks nice. It says, it says MLS, you know, in big letters behind them. They're all dressed nicely. They don't have this awful folded thing that where they look like they're out of a closet. They're in this bright room and it's spacious room. And they're all talking MLS. It was really, really great to see. Uh, let me just say, so yesterday when the Seattle game was on, I texted you that I was going to test out the home radio feature. So if you if people don't remember what this is, you can change the audio option to the home radio team. So only, only if it's your home team, okay? So if you were looking for the uh, Rapids radio, that wasn't going to be broadcast with the Seattle home game it was a seattle video a uh, seattle radio so i decided to play the home radio uh for the game and just see how it worked see how it synced up because i know people that have tried this with baseball right and and if you have like mlb tv after the end of the game not during but after you can rewatch it you can rewatch the game but you can have the radio as the commentary instead and it syncs pretty well but this is live and radio is usually always ahead by at least 30 seconds of TV. So that was something I was kind of looking for and seeing how that would work. And they somehow live got it synced like almost perfect. It was almost perfect. And the way I was able to tell is that there was a ball that was played into the box for the Rapids. And they mentioned, you know, the radio guy is talking more than the TV guy would, right? And the radio guy is saying, like, here he is at the top right corner of the box. Here he is whipping it in. Oh, it's blocked and safe. And all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, this is matching up perfectly with it. And I was like, okay, let's see how it goes. Well, I have to, at halftime, turn it back to the studio show so I can hear the halftime analysis. Or what will it do? it automatically switched back to the Apple TV feed. So I got Mark Rogan Dino talking about the game at halftime with whoever the color commentator was. I forget who it was. Then I was like, now once it switched back, I was worried that I would have to switch it back to radio then. Like it wouldn't re recognize. As soon as the second half kicked off, it switches back to the radio feed and it was great. I, I enjoyed the radio feed so much more because they're so much more excited for the team, you know, the home team. Um, and look, I, you know, I, I am biased towards Seattle for some of the West stuff. So it was nice hearing some of that stuff, hearing Steve Zakawani in the first half. He had to leave. It sounded like he got sick and left at halftime. But, you know, Steve Zakawani, he was a player on Seattle when I was watching them a lot. And uh, in the, you know, 20, 2009, 2010, and before, you know, it, it's it would be tough. It would be like, okay, I'm going to listen to it while I'm showering. I'm going to listen to it while I'm driving. I'm going to have to find it on, on TuneIn or iHeartRadio and listen to it, right? But this was just seamlessly flowing. They synced it perfectly. I don't know how they did it. And I know some people were complaining about the way it worked. It worked perfectly for me. And this was on the TV. It wasn't like on the... Uh, it was on a Fire Stick. It wasn't on an Apple product either. So I want to say it was on the Fire Stick, Apple TV app. And then it was not on my phone. I, I just changed the audio on my TV. And it sounded great. It sounded great. Now, the bad thing with the radio feed is that the, uh, the crowd is not as loud because the radio feed doesn't really have the crowd noise as much as like the TV feed. 
but it still sounded really great. And when they scored, when Seattle scored, which they did four times, it was like electric hearing their commentators do it. So I really like the way that this is working with that. And I might do it a lot. I might do this a lot, uh, especially if it's like a matchup in like the commentary booth. That's kind of like giving me plain vibes where I'm not digging it. Hearing the home team announcer like flip out and be excited for when their team scored is really, really cool. So that worked great. The only thing that I had problems with is when I turned it on, Seattle's radio did start a bit late. It looked like they had a college basketball game that just ended. So the radio team had to like quickly switch over. And that only was like maybe 30 seconds to a minute after kickoff. So it was, it wasn't too bad, but it, Logan, I, I'm, I want you to try this one time. It worked awesome. It was really great. Yeah, I was going to try it with some of the. And if you guys are out there and you're listening to this and it, and you miss the um, locality of your uh, broadcasting, uh, the the guys that were in TV, a lot of them have moved into radio uh, to cover uh, the club because they've lost the broadcast deal with just kind of the local networks and stuff. So if you're missing out on that, a lot of your guys that TV personalities went or gals uh, went to. Um, your radio broadcast. So definitely check that out, Jordan. I'm interested to see how that works because I've done it with baseball and it's usually behind by just a little, like a fraction of a second. And it's kind of weird to watch. And if you try to do it yourself, people have tried that where they like yeah. try to pause their TV yep. and, or pause the radio feed to try to match it with the TV. It takes a lot of work. This worked like perfectly. It was really cool. So I, I do suggest that if you want to, like you said, people that have complained about not having the local announcers. If your team is at home, try the radio feed. Uh, if it's presented there, I don't, I'm not sure if every team has a radio feed, but it worked pretty great. And I, I really liked that it was able to switch back and forth at halftime and back without me having to do anything. I wasn't hearing like the radio ads while they're showing something on the TV. It was able to like, uh, seamlessly work itself out. Um, MLS 360, I didn't get to see much of it. I know you watched some of it, Logan, I think, but uh, I heard some complaints, and I think the biggest complaint is lack of action. The other complaint is lots of commercials in a sport that doesn't have commercials, and with it being billed as a whip-around show like Red Zone, which is famous for not having commercials, that kind of sucks commercial free for whatever four and a half hours so I'm stuck seven remember. hours of commercial free there we football. Go. thank you thank you i couldn't remember how long it was um but yeah no i i watched some of it jordan there was one point that was really funny there's a screenshot or like actually did you know this you cannot screenshot apple product on your phone yes, i tried to do you. it that's wild isn't it uh, but no, I tried to do it, but then somebody like actually captured it on their laptop and just posted it. But there was a moment, Jordan, I'm not kidding, that the four studio analysts were backs to the camera looking I up at the that, screen. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that's not a great look. Um, do what the NFL does. Like, have them voice over. They don't need to be on camera. Like, they really don't. And, and they they actually like not being on camera, from what I've gathered, just because it takes a little bit of that that anxiety out of, like, hey, that my head, my camera, my face is not on camera right now. So I can relax and I can just exactly. tell you what's going on. Exactly. So, and I think that's what makes Scott so great is, like, heck, he go to the bathroom and do it. I mean, I, I don't know where he does it from <laughs> half the time. I'm like, how does the guy do it? Like, how does he do it? I don't understand. Um, I, yeah, you know, I I'm somebody that would, uh, you know, you know my bladder. I oh, cannot I do seven yeah. hours of commercial free football hosting. This is, yeah. <laughs> Jordan's one of those guys. We go to a Marvel movie, right? We went to Jordan. I think we went to, was it Captain which, Marvel? Captain Marvel. Okay. We went to Captain Marvel and he got up at least, you got up at least three times that I can remember. And I did an Ant Man as well. Yes. I went three times. Yeah. I was like, man, I, I'm one of those people that like, I will almost go on myself to, to avoid I've, it. But anyway. I've been that way as a child, though. Like yeah. it's been my whole That's life. Wild. I've I've had a very tiny bladder. Yeah. Well, there you go. Two EMI with Jordan. Um yep. so, no, but yeah, I, I really think Jordan that the, the best thing that they could do is just focus more on the games. Because yes. there were also times they were sitting in front of the screen, it's going on in the background, they're talking, I'm trying to focus, and I'm more like interested in what they're doing, like because they're moving. And I'm and I can't focus. You. Yes, and I can't focus. So it's like why not just throw up the or like do like a side by side? That's what uh, pre, or the Champions League does. Like, that's better at least. Like full screen. Red full zone. Screen there. 
is so. not broken. Yeah. <laughs> right? No. It works. Red zone's not broken. Best product. So just do it. And I understand that there's no red zone in soccer, so it's tougher to figure out, okay, well, this team's close to scoring, so when do we cut to them? I say you flip between three big matchups in the 730 hour, and then when a goal is getting scored, you cut to the thing. You don't even have to say there was a goal. You know, I because I, I've saw some complaints yep. about too that too, where they're yep. like, here's a goal here. Don't NFL tell us that. Does that. Yeah. Don't tell us that. Red zone can kind of they'll, they'll kind of tell you, like, hey, look, this thing that you're about to see, look at this. Third down, boom. Sometimes they don't spoil it. What I'm thinking is, all right, you're flipping. Let's say you're watching Union and Columbus, right? And that's going on. But at the end of the game, we're having the crazy late goals that we had in this thing. And you're like, oh, there was some action here at uh, in D.C. Let's flip to that. And then they flip to that, and you see Benteke headed in. And they're like, oh, my God, that equalizes the game. And then they cut to, oh, Atlanta – uh, just Atlanta's pushing forward. See, they only have to say score. Here comes Atlanta attacking. Flip to it, score or a save. Then you're left hanging. Oh, are they going to score or are they going to save? Um, my sister just asked me if we're sponsored by DoorDash. Uh, no, it's a joke. <laughs> you're <laughs> muted, Logan. <laughs> I was just saying, if DoorDash wants to sponsor us, by all means. Um, but no, we are not. We are not. I should. Pro- I should probably change it. <laughs> I mean, you can't. Really Here, I'm tell. in the press box now. Right. <laughs> back where you belong. Yeah, back where. I belong. So <laughs> anyway, you don't have to say that there is a goal or a save. Um, you can just say, "Here's an attack." And what that does is now you're left hanging. The viewer is like, okay, let's sit and see, you know, and, and red zone kind of does that where red zone will say something like, um, here's the saints driving down the field. Let's switch over to them. And then it's an interception. Now that it wasn't spoiled that it was going to be an interception. And you're like, Oh my God, that was a big play. And you're kind of left thinking that it's happening while it, you're seeing it. But actually they're about 30 seconds ahead of you because they have to know what clip they're queuing up, you know? So that probably would work really well in soccer, I think, because you can even cut to a really big attack that has a nice save or a goal line clearance without saying, here's a goal line clearance. You say, oh, Philly's on the attack. They're down a goal. Let's flip over to them. Oh, and it's a save. That's right. They didn't score, you know, that type of thing. So yeah, that's what I would want from it. You know, and like you said, they'd be more relaxed. They're going to be off screen. Uh, they can introduce, you know, Scott Hansen is sometimes on screen when there's not anything going on. So while it's halftime, they can be sitting there talking to each other saying, hey, we had some great stuff. Why don't we show the replay again? Stuff like that. But th- there's a lot to work with it, that, you know, to to handle this. And you know, with the whip around, like they're they they've got production on it, so it's only a matter of just you know cutting down those clips, and it shouldn't be that difficult because they've got a lot of resources that we don't have um, that they can get access to the copyright of everything. So they just clip it down, show it. Um, it's relatively easy. Uh, they they do it with replay and stuff like that. So it's something that is manageable. I think another thing too to kind of mention is the fact that like um, they they you can't you can't watch all the games anyway. Like if they were up on like a, you know how they do the four box or the eight box or whatever it is, you can't watch all of them. So nobody's wanting that as a fan. We're not sitting there going, Oh, I need to see it instantly. As soon as it happens, I just want to see, okay, here's the build up. Here's like, you know, 30 seconds before here's the nice build up. Mm-hmm, that, exactly. That happened. Or here's the cross that goes in like the crosses. They wouldn't take much time. PKs not take much time, but if there's a real nice build up play, it's not like they couldn't do that. The NFL does, you know, 90 yard, you know, runs and touchdowns and all sorts of different things that almost take longer sometimes than some of the, the goals that happen. So I think it's doable. I think there's a lot of things that they'll iron out. So I, I don't want to be too much of a critic just because I think there are a lot of good things that came out of this weekend and the wall to wall coverage of MLS and a league is nothing like what we have here in the United States. And it's pretty cool. I mean, the, the f- amount of fans that showed up was great the quality of the league, the fact that this can be watched in almost every country, this is going to help the league like tremendously. 
Yeah, I had three coworkers that were watching it that were from the UK. Exactly. Like, I, I had people that have flipped it on because they were in the UK, and that's pretty cool. And it's and it's easy, right? It's it yeah. was free on Apple TV. You know, just having the app this weekend that was great. So yeah, I mean, it, it worked like a charm. Uh, I didn't really have that many issues with the quality, the clarity. I saw some people having issues, but it sounded like that was on them. Every I watched it on my phone. I watched it on my Roku. I watched it on my Fire Stick, and each one was crystal clear. So it looked great. Uh, all right. Well, I guess we can dive into the actual games that happened this weekend. Uh, let's start with the standings, shall we? This is fun. Let, let's overreact with the standings. These are great. <laughs> Top of the East, Philadelphia Union with three points and a Nobody goal saw differential that coming. of three with goals four of four. Um, you know, I didn't see it coming in, in, in the first half. But yes, uh, Miami would be sitting second right now. Uh, and then Nashville in third, DC in fourth. Who had that, right? Cincinnati in fifth. Atlanta in sixth, New England in seventh, Orlando in eighth, and the last playoff spot would go to the Chicago Fire. What a season. If this is how it ended right now, what a season <laughs> this would have been. <laughs> um, and that's because they have zero goal differential. The rest of the teams have negative goal differential because, like I mentioned before, there was no draws. So the first eight teams in the East have three points and then nine through 15 have zero points. And those teams are Chicago, Toronto, Charlotte, New York, Red Bull, Montreal, NYCFC and Columbus sitting bottom due to the negative goal differential. All right. Western conference, Seattle sits top of the uh, West with three points. They also have a four. Uh, they also scored four goals. They have a four goal differential. St. Louis in second, RSL in third, not seventh, Minnesota in fourth, LA Galaxy in fifth, LAFC in sixth, Portland in seventh, Kansas City in eighth, and Austin would be the last playoff team if the season ended today. <laughs> let's let's just act like it's ending today. Um, and then Vancouver in 10th, Houston in 11th, San Jose in 12th, Dallas in 13th, Colorado in 14th. Um, supporter shield standings. Let's check that out. That would be, of course, <laughs> Seattle, Philadelphia, Miami, Nashville, St. Louis, DC. So I just want to point out three of the top five teams are East teams, in the top of the supporter shield standings. <laughs> Again, everybody saw that coming. Everybody saw that. Every coming. single person. So there's a reason why Eastern we called Conference. this the overreaction episode, yeah. because I uh, yeah. just wanted to have some fun with some of those things. I guess Logan, what, before we dive into the individual results, what result, I guess, surprised you the most? And then we can kind of start with that game if you want, instead of going in order. We can do something like that. Well, I think this is an easy one. I think uh, a favorite to win the West, if not second best team in the West, with Austin losing to St. Louis at Austin, at Q2. I, it, it it blows my mind. And then Austin players forgetting that Jared Stroud doesn't play for them any longer. So I, I think there is a lot to be concerned with. I think if you're an Austin fan, I know there was a lot of ripping on, Oh, Jared Stroud's an awful human being for what he did. I'd try it. <laughs> I would have been trying it. Why not? If it works, it works. It did work. I don't know. And here's how the thing. We don't, forgot. we don't actually know if he did it because if he right. did do it, it is against the rules. That's and true. I think that they would have, people would have appealed. Nobody it, appealed. To the ref, yeah, to say he just called for. Yeah, that. there is a fa there is a point though. Like I I'll give you this, there is a point. I, I thought it was gonna get called because he points down. You know when they point down to their feet, like here, like the yeah, ball yeah. here. He kind of does that, but then he like he's like, no, no, never mind. But I think maybe because... he was confused. Did we ever think of that? Maybe he was the confused yeah. one, and he's yeah. thinking, I'm still in Austin. Pass right. it here. Right, and, and maybe then he, he was gets, like. like Never mind, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, you know what else it could have been, Jordan? And and we talked about this kit. If you look at that kit long enough, things start to spin. Like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like an optical illusion. Things started spinning. He was confused. He was really confused. Right. Yeah, Stop wearing those. He looked down kits. and saw the gray and was like, oh no, I'm on St. Louis. Right. 
<laughs> but yeah, I, I think Jordan, I think we can all say that that was a shocking result because I, I thought Austin was going to come out like world beaters and absolutely smash in the new team. And they did not, they didn't even look close to it. So, so let's start, let's start with that game. Cause all I've right, seen a lot it. of people and by a lot of people, I mean, Austin fans really, yeah. really upset about this game because, well, they had a lead. It was two one. Yeah. And you know, they give it up. Um, I saw a lot of people getting mad at the at the player that passed it to Stroud. I also yeah. saw people saying Zardes should never start again. Yeah. Um, look, the whole team wasn't good enough, is what I'll say. I can't put this down to Zardes. I can't put this down to that one pass because when you're at home against the new expansion side, after you finished second in the West and you have two shots on goal, it's not good enough. Yeah, I, I think they're stark. Players came out and played well. I think Diego Fagunes played well. He had an assist. Um, Driussi does get off the mark and gets one goal. Wolf played extremely well, I thought, too. Bisonin, um, the new guy in the defense, uh, the one that I think we all had big question marks, he was easily the best defender, and, uh, and it wasn't even a question. Uh, I think they miss having Alex Green kind of in that central midfield, um, you know, starting every minute of the game. Um with one of the best defensive midfielders that we have in this league it is going to be vital to their success defensively. And they, it went back, Jordan, you and I questioned this though. We said this team is great in the attack. There's no question, but if their defense has any kind of similarities to what it had once uh, when they weren't good defensively, it, 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 it causes some concerns. And I think there were some concerns there. I think you can't just rely on Stuver to be this excellent goalkeeper, this ball that's not going to let stuff through. When you've got Cassante, who's not, you know, I, I don't think played that well. I don't think Lima played well either. So it was just a mix of guys that just it defensively left a lot to be desired. And I think that's ultimately the, a concern for Austin. Yeah. Uh, Stuver was, I guess, all right. I, I, I know, I know there were some sort of issues there, but here's the thing. St. Louis, 18 shots to 13, all right? Nine shots on goal to two. That's just crazy. Tim Parker, by the way, uh, first goal in St. Louis history, so that's pretty cool, and that's their first win. Uh, we have a comment here. Kippy didn't look where he was kicking. That's the player that kicked at the Stroud. A mistake I doubt he'll ever do again. Austin actually played much better in the second half, but allowed a couple of fatal mistakes. Yeah, I saw some people complaining about the first half from Austin because, you know, Parker did score first, by the way. It was a 1-0 lead, right? Uh, do I have that right? Uh, yes. He, yes. Yeah, he was. They were up 1-0, and then they went 1-0. Yeah. And then Drusi in the 45th plus four made it 1-1. And then, yeah, Gallagher makes it 2-1. Stroud makes it 2-2 in the 78th minute. And then just eight minutes later, it's Klaus, uh, one of the players that we were talking with, ball watching, right, with uh, about him needing to score some goals. He comes up and scores the winner. So on the St. Louis side, we talked about the Austin side, how disappointing it was. But for uh, St. Louis getting their first goal, getting their first win, they scored three goals in their first MLS game. It was a way from home what we all thought was going to be a pretty tough game and it was you know they had to come back from behind twice uh i mean one uh yeah once actually sorry um but how deflating it be when you can score your first goal and then right before halftime you concede and then you concede again to go down and you think sometimes we're going to fold it in now right like you're i'm a new team we're not going to be able to do it and then they come back and score two late goals to win it as if you're a St. Louis fan, that's got to be really inspiring. You just took down the the two <laughs> in the West who yeah. made it all the way to a conference final mm -hmm. last year. Yeah, and uh, again, I think one of the best attacking uh, teams in the league, I would say, um, especially if Sebastian plays the way that he does um, and did last year. I mean, this this guy is an incredible talent. Um, honestly, I'm shocked he's still there. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how long he stays. He seems pretty content staying there for a while. So, I, I mean, I'm really impressed with the attacking force that Austin have. But for St. Louis to come into enemy territory, and Jordan, you and I talked about this, how important is it that St. Louis grabs a Tim Parker, right? Even a Jared Stroud. Austin casts him off like an exile and says, you know what? He's never really fit in anywhere that he's been in MLS. He goes to St. Louis, and while, yes, it's one of those gimmicky goals, probably doesn't happen again, right? Kip Keller doesn't make that same mistake again. 
Um, that's pretty rare to see that kind of mistake. You see it from a goalkeeper usually making that mistake, but not a defender looking back and going, oops, that's the wrong jersey. Um, but I think if you look at St. Louis, the MLS experience is massive, and you can't overlook that. And I think that's that's really important. Joao Klaus gets his first goal, and that's huge too because once a number nine in this league finds success, it's pretty quick after that they start to figure out how to play in this league. And if this is going to be this early for Klaus, this is great for uh, St. Louis fans, and I think you can look forward to maybe not sitting bottom of the West if you continue to play like this and you bounce back. Yes, it wasn't great defensively, and yes, Austin made mistakes. But again, we sit here all the time, right, Jordan, where we say that eighth team made too many mistakes. That union team didn't finish first and get Eastern Conference or sorry, home field advantage because they made a few mistakes down the road. Austin, yes, you made mistakes. But you can't keep doing it. You can't keep getting away with it. And I get that. And it's and yeah, it is. As a Austin fan, it is embarrassing. Yeah, I would say yes, because you are one of the top teams in this league. You don't see an LAFC make a lot of these mistakes. You don't see a union make a lot of these mistakes. You got to be careful because once they start to rack up, they rack up too quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you're an Austin fan, which I do see, like when I'm on, you know, Twitter, we follow a lot of them. It, it was a lot of kind of like hoping that they're not sliding backwards, right? Like it's like, okay, let's hope that this is not what we are this year. Okay, we dropped that one. We have to move on from that because I, I do if they continue to struggle, people are going to look at last year and think maybe that was just an, you know, a flash in the pan type of situation, which is not what they uh, would want. You, we've talked about how they want to build off of that. Right. Um, and look, I had a lot of Austin fans talking smack to, to us uh, about our predictions because uh, I put Dallas above them. And uh, they're like, they'll finish ahead of Dallas, which they still might Dallas lost. Right. But it, it's like, then they come out and, and lost in a pretty embarrassing moment. And it's kind of like, Ooh, maybe we shouldn't be talking. <laughs> right. It's kind of like, that's why I don't talk when it comes to that stuff about my team. I'm like, no, I'll, no, that's I'll when you quiet. That's, <laughs> that's when you I'll sit on your quiet. hands and go, I'll just wait to see how this goes um, yeah. because well, this could go yeah, bad. I'll wait until we win the cup and then especially I'll, and then I'll just talk smack. Yeah, yeah. Especially this league in St. Louis. There you go. You got your first taste of the league. This league is absolutely wild and anything can happen. Oh, it was beautiful. Uh, and your Jersey is beautiful. I really like mm, the gray yeah. with the pinstripes. Yep. It looks, it looks great. Yep. Let's move on from that one. I'm going to give you my surprising yeah, shock one. Yeah. All right. And this is where I thought you were going to go, but I'm glad you didn't. It's also another 3-2 score. I got DC United beating Toronto at home here, which uh, they took an early lead with Klish scoring his first goal in MLS. He scores a pretty good goal. 13th minute. And then Bernadeschi gets a penalty in the 66th minute to equalize. Mark Anthony K scores in the 83rd minute and then also like pulls a muscle. Uh, and then... You're thinking, oh, Toronto's gonna Toronto's gonna steal this one away after you know uh, kind of struggling here again, right? Kind of struggling again, Toronto. What's going on there? But we're gonna win. That's the vibe I was getting from as I'm following the scores, as I'm in the press box of the Union game, and then Benteke, who we talked about was a big signing last year, and can he score in this league? Can he do a good job? Well, he gets a nice header. 2-2. Two, two. And then Coup Di Pietro scoring in the 90 plus 8. <laughs> last last gasp goal here. And you know what's funny is I saw a tweet, I think it was from one of the accounts saying, Benateke has tied it at the death. And then I'm like scrolling on my phone, like, this game is still going on. Like, how yes. long is it? I've and then I too. see that they won it. And I'm like, okay, now they won it at the death. <laughs> but Toronto had 55% possession to DC's 44. DC outshot them 10 to 7. They had more shots on goal, 5 to 4. And they got the goals that mattered at the end of the game here. 17,000 people, which is actually a pretty decent amount for uh, a team like DC at Audi Field. Wayne Rooney's men start out with a win, Logan. They're, uh, you know, near the top of the East right now. <laughs> 
I mean, you and I talked about this, right? We said if the Benteke thing gets turned around and he starts scoring goals, Seba or uh, Mateus Klich, I always wanted to call him Sebastian for some reason. Mateus Klich comes over and he contributes in the midfield. If they can get a good season for Taxi Fountas when he is out there on the pitch, if Pedro Santos plays well, if Jais comes in and he defends well, if Tyler Miller figures out and, and can play in this league again as the number one goalkeeper, we thought DC United could make a run at the ninth playoff spot. Like that's not out of the question. And I think this proves it. I love the end. Like you said, Jordan, um, when D Pietro runs over, he gives the, shh, the Dame Lillard get silent. I don't care. I'm shutting you down. I have hardly any experience in the MLS, but let me just shut you up. And honestly, I mean, if you're looking at the other side, Toronto, just like we thought, if Insigne gets hurt, if one of these guys gets hurt, it's a it's bad because they don't have any depth. They got none. So like past Insigne, it's kind of like oh crap. Um, and it is a leg, it's a leg injury. Um, it's not good when there are leg injuries in soccer usually. So um, whether it's precautionary or not, he's going to miss some time, I think. And if if this is the way that it's going to go, this roster is going to struggle. And Toronto right there with them. And, it, and I think that's kind of what we saw as a tale of two different two different teams. Yeah, I, I think if we're doing overreactions, my overreaction yeah. is I'm worried about Toronto, right? I'm yeah. worried about Bob Bradley's job at this point because uh, he's been given a lot of pieces right now. If he can't put <laughs> it together this year, yeah. uh, just to even finish ninth, then that, that'll be a big problem if they can't do that. Now, of course, it's early. It's one game, right? So obviously the playoff bar is so low this year. 60-some percent of the teams are getting in. Yeah. So his job might be saved from that, but you know, look, this is a team that I was kind of uh, high on here. I have Toronto is finishing seventh. You have them finishing six. We're both kind of thinking after this week, not great. But also, if you want to look at it on the DC side, they were at home. They had an early lead. They gave it up. So on a DC side, they did exactly what they needed to do, and we probably shouldn't think about them as, as bad as they were last year. I think I, I do think DC is going to improve this year with some of these signings that they had. So uh, yeah, that, that one was a shock to me. I, I was kind of, I was kind of pulling for DC to be honest uh, because, you know, I, I like the Rooney stuff. My dad's a DC fan. So it was, it was just kind of fun to sit there and see how they can pull out. I like Christian Benteke. A lot. I like their so, team a lot. Like I really do. I do. Yeah, me too. So I, you know, th they're going to be a team to watch. I think if we're going to go over reactions again, like we know how silly it sounds to be reacting this much on week one. But yeah, but I think you made a really good point, and we kind of you know skated over it. Wayne Rooney's coaching and the things that he did at Derby County. Yeah. I they cannot go unspoken just because it 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 was amazing what he did to start out with that many points deduction and bring them all the way back to the death. It, it was like, wow, this is an amazing coaching job. And I think Wayne Rooney is exactly that. He just embodies everything that DC is and he's played there. So it's, it's personal for him. And I, and I think you kind of see that through the team. I think what we should do next is go to the games that we were at. So yeah. we're going to go to, uh, we're, we're going to jump over to Logan. Logan was at Orlando Red Bulls as part of his Christmas or birthday gift opening day. What was it like in the stadium? What was the vibes and how did that game play out? Because I know it, when I looked, Orlando had like zero XG yeah. and it was like halftime. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just the vibes, uh, the stadium, the fans, they're always some of the best fans, uh, whether you like them or not. I, I know they are a very um, divisive group. <laughs> um, uh, they are very angry all the time. Uh, they seem to be somebody that uh, – they seem to be fans that people pick at, uh, and they will pick at you. They are relentless. They are petty. They are everything that I love uh, as an Orlando City fan. But that being said, Jordan, there is still some concern, I think, with just the fact that we're in Orlando. It's a, it's a hot state, just like Miami – we tend to have a hard time filling stadiums here in Florida. Um, if you look around at all these sports, unless the team has like got the star power and got the, the, the snaz and the jazz and everything else teams. The uh, jazz kinda, is in Utah. Right. Well, then they, they get a lot of fans. So maybe I'm wrong. Um, but no, uh, yeah, that, I think the vibes were great. The food options, Jordan, that's the, what I'm most excited about. They added a bunch of the local Orlando. Oh, restaurants. really? Yeah. It's so cool. I've never seen anybody do that. Like, I, you know, I've not been around a lot of stadiums, but I've never seen 
uh, oh philly has it and, and okay. so does yeah. uh so does uh like camden yards they That's have cool, a lot then. of local stuff yeah, yeah it's great it's great because it, it does it adds like they've got four rivers for barbecue they've got teak which is a burger bar like so but again electric atmosphere stadium never lets down like it, they are they are a great fan base uh and i talked about this on my podcast uh, city beautiful sc um and we talked nice about play. yeah i talked about uh the fact that like i think this fan base is special and unique because we do get a lot of the latin culture infused into it just because of where we are the locale we get a lot of brazilian fans we've got a lot of there was a family of like six or seven all wearing colombian fan or like uh, kits, and I thought it was great because they were so into it. And I'm excited to see that because it means that our our sport in this country has arrived when fans from Argentina and Venezuela and, you know, Colombia and Argentina and – or sorry, said Argentina, but Uruguay when they arrived. But, yeah, fan base was great. I thought it was, it was a fantastic night, beautiful night. Um, however, Jordan, that being said – it was a uh, it was an uneventful game. <laughs> it was uh, it was a lot of midfield. It was a whole lot of midfield. You'd have been screwed um, because you couldn't yeah, see the midfield. We'll talk about that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you were in the Philadelphia press box, you couldn't have seen the midfield. And this game was played mostly in the midfield. At the Red Bull Jordan, when they play, they just muddy everything up. Like the way that they play, it's just it's like that bash and shma- bash and smash uh, kind of defense and pressing and. So there's not a whole lot going on. It's chaotic. There's, you know, guys aren't uh, to their top uh, levels yet and passing, distributing. Um, and I thought it was just a real muddy game. Uh, Orlando looked awful in the first half. Uh, I thought, uh, I think they didn't create much anything. And they did not I looked at right. the stats. They did not. Yeah. And their defense, <laughs> their defense, Rodrigo Schlegel cannot be your number one center. Or your, sorry, your number two center back. Um, Antonio Carlos didn't play. Um, and if we have to rely on Schlegel to be, a center back, I think he's kind of taken a step backwards as he's gotten a little older. But overall, not a great game, but it was nice to see Facundo Torres play well and Cesar Arujo played fantastic. So um, our defensive midfielder, who I don't think will be here past this year because I think he's that good. Well, you did. You, you talked about the fans and stuff. I, I do yeah. want to say the official attendance was 24,000. It's yeah. 25, so that's not yeah. bad. No, it wasn't bad, but I think for a home opener in this city, it should have sold out. No question, which yeah. is weird. But the Magic were playing too, so I think that had a lot to do with it. Probably. You know, one thing I want to say too is I, I think this team was really hyped up, right? The, both of these teams, by the way. The That's Red true. Bulls yeah. and Orlando were both very hyped up going into the season. Uh, Orlando with a lot of signings, right? People have called it the best window of the, the best team that, that – the best window that a team had this window. But that's going to take some time to gel – so I can kind of see why maybe, you know, it's kind of disappointing when I'm looking at the stats and while, while I'm at the press box, you know, and I'm looking and I'm like asking you how it's going. And I decide to check the stats. And I'm like, Ooh, zero XG. We're like 40 minutes into this game. That's not great. You know, but it's, it's going to take some time to gel. The penalty was a handball, right? Yes. Sorry. I yeah. That, my we, both of, both yes. of the ones were as well. Right. So uh, I, I heard that uh, I, I did see the highlight of it. It was it was kind of a it was iffy. <laughs> it was kind of iffy. It was yeah. iffy. Yeah, you it hit body. I mean, Orlando kind of got bailed out yeah. here a little bit. Um, but the the Red Bulls. I want to I want to ask you what you thought of the the Red Bulls here, how they were uh, looking this game because when I'm looking at the stats here, they had 14 shots to Orlando six, and the only shot that Orlando had on goal, by the way, was the penalty. Yeah, so looking at the Red Bull and Vincere is not playing yet, uh, which is their big signing up top. Tom Barlow started uh, along with Manuel up top. And I thought Manuel played really well. I thought he was Corey Burke at the game. But I could like we were far enough away. He was he's built like Corey. And I can't I couldn't see because they're on the other side of the pitch. So I'm texting Jordan like, dude, Corey Burke has been like great. I don't know what's going on. And I I didn't I usually check my phone before the match to see who I'm looking at. Um, for the other team, I just didn't this time because I think we were, I was so into like they were they that's the other thing they they did uh, raise the banner for the U.S. Open Cup that was freaking awesome. I uh, bet that seemed pretty the, cool, huh? Yeah, the highlights were fantastic. Like the way that they mixed in video and, and audio uh, music and just blaring through the stadium was really cool. But uh, and then seeing the trophy just like all of a sudden the light cuts on and it's just the trophy down in center pitch and it was fantastic. 
Um, yeah, how jealous are you are you of our friend Matt who got to like pose with the trophy with Kingston? Yeah, yeah. Kingston? Yeah, what the heck, man? Um, yeah, no, really He's not jealous. Not even a fan. What's yeah, what going the hell? on? Um, yeah, no, not fair. But Jordan, I will say, Red Bull. I can see why a lot of people think they're going to be a top team in the East, including us, because defensively in the midfield, you can't get anything. You, you're just not going to get anything. That midfield is a beast uh, between Casares, between Frankie and Maya, who I think is pretty underrated defensively. I think he does pretty well defensively for a little guy. Um, Lewis Morgan, I think is a great player. He's had the, he's had a couple of shots on target, but yeah, there you go. My U S open cup winners. Um, you'll be raising the banner next, but the one that was disappointing Jordan. And and that's a big concern, I guess, is Lucinia's again, kind of like a ghost. I didn't know he was out there half the time, uh, which was kind of the problem last year. So yeah, I'm interested to see how that works, but their defense is probably one of the top defenses in this league. I think I'm going to go with that just because of what I saw. I thought they were just fantastic defensively, and Orlando has a lot of attacking options, and they shut them all down. So, all right, so let's look at the union and the crew here. This was yes, I was in the press box where I was sitting. It was kind of kind of like how if you're watching our video feed, how my silhouette is blocking the midfield of Subaru park. It was like that. Now, I mean, of course I could still see it. Thankfully they have the TVs on and I'm able to kind of maneuver at times, but if it was like right in the circle, I, I couldn't see, but um, it, it was, it was good atmosphere. There, it was one of the loudest. I think I've heard it when they're shouting their uh, go back to Ohio chant that they were doing. That was once we were up like three, one, four, one. Um, but it didn't start out great. 28 minutes in, Glesna's own goal here. It was originally credited to Matan, but it, it does come off Glesna's. It was switched over to a Glesna's own goal. And that was... For the first 15 minutes, the Union couldn't even get the ball. They couldn't even control the ball. They couldn't do anything. And I was you know, live-tweeting it. And it was fairly in the Union's half here on the river end, where it, which is where the crew were attacking in the first half. And it was it was pretty bleak. And let me tell you, crew are going to be good. I, I, I don't think we can kind of let this game shine too much of an issue on them because there was two handball calls, or else this game's a two to one, right? Like it's a little closer then. So, in my estimation, they're going to be good. Zella Ryan looked great. Zella Ryan looked really great. He was hooking up with Chucho Hernandez. They were looking great. They were attacking. They were playing great. They like they were the MVPs of the first half. Nagby was doing pretty well in the first half. That all kind of changed in the second half. But then we kind of go into the 45th plus three minutes where Gazdag has a penalty kick from a handball. It makes it 1-1. And we go into halftime. Halftime 1-1. One, one. And then we open up the second half, 52nd minute. Julian Carranza scores his first goal of the season, assisted by Bedoya and Gazdag. Remember, they count the secondary assist. That was Gazdag. Passing it to Bedoya. Passing it to Carranza. Um, so I wanted to highlight that because a lot of people were asking on the Opta Opta posted something saying about how Gazdag was like the first player to have two goals to assist, uh, something like that, in a opening day or something. There you go, MVP. So uh, I'll, I'll find I'll find the thing here uh, in a second. But that was one thing, and I keep getting these people saying, "How did he assist on the penalty kicks?" Because he didn't assist on anything else. And I'm like, they count the hockey assist. That's why. He has it. So this is what it is. Up to Jack posted. Daniel Gazdag is the fourth player in MLS history. Fourth, okay? And the first since Brian Ching and Dwayne De Rosario in 2006 to contribute to four goals in his team's season opening match. The other Nate player was Jason Christ in 1999. So it doesn't happen a lot. Now, of course, the issue is they're counting the secondary assists. If you were in any other league, this is not counting as an assist, but MLS counts this, so whatever. The next penalty happens in the 72nd minute where Gazdag scores it, and then the next goal happens in the 80th minute, just like 20 seconds after Joaquin Torres comes in for Ura, and it goes Tor uh, 
Torres, uh, no, Gazdag passes it to Torres. Torres does like two spin moves and then makes a killer pass to Carranza again. And Carranza scores. And it was just a beautiful movement. I'm looking to see if anybody's offside because there's quite a few offsides in that game. And it it was beautiful buildup. And that sealed it. 4-1 for the Philadelphia Union. I have some quotes here from Jim Curtin. This is him on uh, the Columbus crew. Start by saying um, this Columbus team is going to be very, very, very good. Uh, if you look at the first 15 minutes of the game tonight, we didn't touch the soccer ball. So, you know, you can see the ideas that um, Wilfred's going to have with them, uh, just how good they're going to be, how dangerous they're going to be uh, of a team in the Eastern Conference this season. So Jim Curtin really high on the Columbus crew. And that's the vibe I was getting from the crew as I was watching them too. They looked really good. It was just unlucky with two penalties. And, and you know, Nancy says this in the press conference. I couldn't get this part recorded, but he did say they didn't really deserve to give up four goals. And I saw some union fans like laughing at that, but I, I see what he's talking about. Those two penalties are handball. You know, Nancy was asked about that as well. And, you know, do you think they're penalties? He said, by the new rules, those are handballs. Um, so they're penalties. But you could kind of tell he was thinking, like, like that sucks, you know, but we they were handballs. So it kind of is what it is, right? Uh, you can't really plan for handballs. And then here's Curtin on, um, on uh, Julian Carranza. Or is it on – hold on. I, I forget who I have this on. I think this is on – uh, the depth and uh, Torres. Yeah, look, um, it's a shame because we have, you know, I, I think five or six guys tonight that are warming up and I have to look down at them and, and I know they're starters, starting quality, you know, in this league. So it's hard, you know, and, and they're going to get their opportunities. So um, we've really preached to the guys, everybody's got to be patient. You know, whatever amount of minutes you get, you have to maximize. And uh, I'll just say what well, he maximized his minutes. You know, within 20 seconds, he, he makes a game-changing play. Uh, and, and the pass he makes there is – that's a next-level pass because I thought, or, you know, probably like the rest of the people in the stadium, that he was going to play the easy ball, which was out wide, and, and we kind of, you know, keep possession, but it's not a killer pass. And he goes against the grain and sees Julian in a way that um, the special players can see. Uh, I, I, I never had that in my bag as a, as a player, um, so it must be fun. Uh, but Joaquin's going to help this team uh, a ton. I think he's going to contribute a lot. And uh, great kid, works so hard. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that the fans got to see almost instantly uh, just how special he's going to be. Says him talking to Joaqu- uh, Joaquin Torres, who they got from Montreal uh, in a trade to add to the depth and uh, immediately comes in and makes a huge impact, which is just amazing for for this team. Um, this is exactly what you want to see from there. And he's talking about, you know, how he has to look at five players warming up before the game and how they can be starters in this league. So this is something the union don't really have, didn't really have a lot of in the past. So they're kind of getting more of the depth. And in another quote, he kind of talks about how he hopes Julian Carranza has a full season here because there's already maybe some interest that Ernst Tanner is going to have to fight off because of how well he's playing. So uh, that, that really shocked me, actually. I, I didn't really think Carranza would get that interest from overseas right now, but it sounds like that might be a real possibility. Yeah, I like what the union did here, um, adding Joaquin Torres to that midfield, adding uh, the depth with the Julian Carranza last year. Um, because Mikel Ura, like, you know, dependent upon how he plays this year, Julian's a nice second option to have. Jordan, they didn't have that before. I mean, they were relying on guys like Sergio Santos. Uh, Shabelko was there. Uh, Shabelko was a Corey starter. Burke, right? <laughs> Corey Burke. Like, you're, you're looking at guys that just never panned out as serious strikers and nines in this league. But that's interesting that that Jim said that. I, I wouldn't have thought that either, that that uh, there would be interest of, for Julian Carranza uh, overseas. But I guess it's warranted with how well he's played lately. Yeah, and just looking at the stats, like the crew outpossessed the Union fifty nine to forty percent. Uh, shots though were Union fourteen to seven, uh, and shots on goal was five to two. So the crew were, were dangerous; they were creating stuff, but their shots would always be just wide or over the bar, and not really on target. I think there was a few times I'm like live tweeting, and it says like Zella Ryan rips a shot, and it's 
wide or high over the bar. Chucho shoots and it's wide. Um, so they felt more dangerous than they probably, I guess the stats make them seem not as dangerous as they were, but they were dangerous, especially the first half. And then it kind of tailed off in the second half and the union started possessing and owning it a lot more as they went. So I don't know. It, it was really cool to see that and be at the press conference and get those quotes. So hopefully you'll see more of that. I'm, I'm hoping to maybe get credentialed for DC at some point and kind of just kind of continue expanding some of our coverage um, to just, you know, including some of these press conference bits, which, which I think helps kind of get an understanding of what's going on. Um, but yeah, the, the union, Hey, they, they turned it on in the second half. I, I was worried as a union fan in the, in the press box, you're seeing this team, And I was like, that wasn't a great first half, like at all. And you were talking about the same thing with Orlando, how you could tell it's early season. Some of the stuff wasn't sharp. It wasn't there, but in the second half it was. And, um, you know, they just were able to kind of get out of a funk before it really buried them, which some of these teams did not get a chance to do, but let's take a look at Nashville NYCFC. Talk about a funk. NYCFC lose this game 2-0. Zimmerman scored in the 34th minute, and Schaufelberg finished it in the 80th minute. And NYCFC outpossessed them 62 to like 38%. They finished even with shots 9-9, nine nine, but Nashville had four shots on goals to two shots on goal. And they just, you know, Nashville looked more dangerous than NYCFC. This is an issue that NYCFC is going to have probably throughout the season. Yeah. And this was all without Hani Mukhtar until the 75th minute. So yeah. Do we know why he was, he just, resting? I think it was, yeah, I think it, yeah, I think it's just coming back off the off season. I don't know if he, he, I'm guessing he was dealing with some kind of nagging thing or if he hadn't been back because came uh, in and got an assist. I was going to say like five minutes. Well, <laughs> they, they look completely different when he came on. Like it, yeah. like they look pretty decent. Like they get the early goal at 34th minute. Um, their defense played well, like usual with Nashville. Um, I think they're probably pretty happy that they're back on this side of the the, the uh, league yeah. in the Eastern yeah. Conference. They're like, oh, this is way better than that. <laughs> that crap. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I, you know what I thought? Schaffelberg played fantastically. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't think he can keep that up at a high rate. Maybe I could be wrong, but I, I just – he never struck me as somebody that was going to be this superstar in this league. He played well, though, and honestly, he carried the team for quite some time. I thought Fafab looked pretty decent, too. He did, but, yeah. But, again, I say this. They're still missing a nine. Like, and it's it's mm-hmm. pretty obvious. Like, T.L. Burnberry cannot be that guy that you're going to rely on to put away goals. I mean, if they had, like, a Vasquez or, you know, like a uh, – I don't know, even like a Corey Burke or something like that, they just don't have that. Like, they don't have – anybody that's going to look goal threatening in front of and face of the goal. So it just, it doesn't make sense to me that they've never paired him up. Like you said, Zellerion looks great with Cucho. I think that could be one of the most lethal duos in the league. If they get it on target. Yeah. <laughs> that was, right. That's kind of yeah. their issue. Right. But you know, w- what I like about this Nashville team is that even mm-hmm. without honey Mukhtar for 75 that's minutes, true. they got the job done against a depleted NYCFC, a team that they should beat, a team you know that we shouldn't really be saying they should beat, but because NYCFC, NYCFC didn't invest in the squad this year, they should beat them, and they did, and I like that they did because I think that shows, hey, you know? And now, of course, St. Louis would look at them and say, hey, the West wasn't that hard. We just beat Austin in our first year. What are you talking about? You know, but, but for Nashville, you know, coming back to the East, getting your – getting the job done, getting a, a, a three points in the first week and having your MVP of the league sit for 75 of those minutes, come on and assist, I think is a, a great start for a home. You know, we, we talk about how big some of these games are for like home and away. Austin lost theirs at home. Nashville came out and did exactly what they needed to do. So I really like that they uh, were able to do so. So. Good start to the season. That was the first game of the of the week of the year. Now Atlanta gave their sixty five thousand fans quite the scare as they face San Jose. Jeremy Abobasi comes in, starts the game, twelfth minute scores a goal, and we're like, man, San, uh, San Jose looking 
pretty sharp, looking pretty good. Now, Atlanta had 60% of the possession. They had 20 shots to San Jose's 10, but only five of those were on target to four for San Jose. And two of those are at the very end of the game. Tiago Almada, 90 plus three. Tiago Almada, 90 plus nine. How long does he stay in this league? He was at the World Cup. He comes and saves his team here. A pretty good start for Atlanta after looking kind of lacking a finishing uh, finishing touch there. Yeah. Um, poor San Jose, man. Like, you can't defend. You, you, you clearly can't. It's been two years. Oh, sorry, it's been four years. <laughs> it's, it's been a very long time since this team has had a good defense and just completely fell apart. Like, they just completely came unraveled. And, again, Tiago Amal- Almada uh, is a player that I think, Jordan, we're not going to see for very much longer. Um I think it's pretty clear that he's probably one of the first ones, first pieces to fall in the summer, just because of how good he is. Um, and then you're looking at an Atlanta team that's pretty, pretty empty. So, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to kind of see what Atlanta does with Garth Lockway, uh, kind of retooling and rebuilding this team. I think it's going to be a major rebuild if they if they end up do losing uh, Almada. It's good to see Miles Robinson back and Brad Guzan. So that was that was exciting. But man, what a fall apart job by the San Jose Quakes story of their life right now (laughs) you know unfortunately you know when we're looking at atlanta though great start to the loggerway era they (laughs) come out and and you know what loggerway is probably looking at the price tag of almada and says hand it over because i can really build a team with this so he's probably like all right yeah keep scoring late goals like this but this is what also the mls 360 was really great at is because as these goals are coming in we have the two DC goals coming in, and we also had the New England goal coming in. Like they were flying hot and heavy. It was really, really cool. And what I would recommend if you're worried about like turning on MLS 360 and getting commercials, what I would recommend one screen, the game you want to watch, a second screen, the whip around show is probably how I would plan that out for my days. Um, but no, I mean, this was. Uh, a, a great start for Atlanta after looking a little toothless for uh, for a good chunk of the game there. Um, let's move on to Charlotte and New England. Another one of those games that had a late goal. Kessler scoring in the 89th minute. This was at Charlotte. They had 69,000 fans there, apparently. Uh, they finished pretty even. On the game, 54% to 47% possession. Charlotte edged it out. Shots were both 15 and 15. New England had five shots on goal to Charlotte's four. This game finished 1-0. And what was not a really, like, I would say probably, like, thrilling game, but uh, lots of shots, not too many on target. Just a bummer for Charlotte to kind of get off on the wrong foot here at home. But New England... Uh, coming out and doing well. And I will say my fantasy goalkeeper (laughs) who was my captain of the week as well. So he got me a ton of points and there's rumors. He might be uh, leaving sometime soon as well, but new England who really have been kind of projected to do so great, come out and get an away win right away. So that's, that's gotta be feeling great. Yeah. um, I mean, I think Carlos heel is going to be Carlos heel. Uh, you know, I, I think is there signs that he could regress? It, I think it'll just depend on on some of the team around him. I, I think he's a special player, but I think it's also going to be determined uh, around him and the pieces that they put together. Um, I thought Noel Buck for looked pretty decent um, for most of the game, and then he kind of tails off. Uh, or sorry, sorry, he didn't start as well, but but kind of got better and found his footing. Um, Romney played well. I thought Kessler played well. Um, Kessler was really good. Uh, I really do enjoy watching him play. Um, Dewan Jones, fantastic. I, and again, we talked about this. I don't think Dewan Jones lasts much past this. If if he gets through the summer, I don't think it'll be much longer until he's gone as well. And we talked about Petrovic. I think that there's a good chance he's sold in the summer. Um, this team, again, I think we're going to look at this team every single week and say the same thing, Shorten. Like, Carlos Heel is really good, but are the guys around him going to be able to contribute like they should? I don't know. Veroni leaves a lot to be desired. I, I'm not sure. Gustavo Bowes back in the United States. I saw that uh, on Twitter. So he is back. 
after dealing with some green card issues, like half the league. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is insane. It's so stupid. Um, and, and the fact that it's like, is it the is it the team's fault? Is it the players' fault? Is it the I think it's fault the for I think it's so the last countries. Minute? I think it's the it's government. So last fault. minute yeah. though, like it's so stupid. I think maybe because they have to give them a start of work date, and it's probably like you know within a month, and then they're like, well, we can't get you that that quick. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that there. But they, there's guys in this league that have been. It's guys in this league that have been here, so I don't understand. Anyway, uh, but Gustavo Bo's back. I'm just not sure that this talent up top is going to be enough to kind of supplement Carlos Heel. And I think if you don't, you're wasting him again. And I think that's the same story. We talk about this all the time. We talk about this in the preview. You're wasting one of the best players to play in this league. And I just feel like they just haven't done enough with his tenure there. Uh, they've won a supporter shield. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, good win though. Charlotte looked awful. <laughs> they just don't look like they have any kind of teeth in the attack right now. And that's not good. Um, so De- Swiderski wasn't in, uh, Capetti did start up at the nine, but he didn't look great. And he's, he's one of those players, Jordan. I think it's going to be one of those, like, it's going to take him a year to grow into this league. He feels like one of those, he's a younger guy. He doesn't feel like he's got a lot around him. That's going to create like a Joe's jo- 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 Um, I-, I don't think he creates enough. Uh, Swiderski, if he's going to play in behind him as a 10, I don't know if that's going to be enough to kind of supplement Copetti, but yeah, Charlotte, yeah, not great. So jump over to Cincy versus uh, Houston here. We're not very high on Houston. We're high on Cincinnati. Sergio Santos scores in the 19th minute. We get a equalizer in the 45th plus two for Schmidt on Houston. To make it 1 1, we go in a halftime. 48th minute, Nuobodo scores in the 48th minute to make it 2 1, and that's how the game finishes. Houston outpossessed Cincinnati. Not should, should be shocking. Cincinnati kind of sets up like the Union where they'll kind of allow some of that. Um, but 62% possession to 37%. Present uh, four, uh, 19 shots to 14 shots, though. Houston edged that out, and they edged out the shots on goal. Seven of uh, seven to five, but they could not edge out the, the actual goals. So Houston finishes with a loss. Cincinnati gets off on the right foot. They're supposed to win those games. They did win that game. It's at home, uh, you know, in front of, of 25,000 people at two TQL. So great start for since he kind of expected for Houston. Yeah, this is a game you got to win. Um, and they did. I think Cincinnati. Played well. Um, obviously, I think there's still some some rust to knock off for some of these teams. I think Cincinnati um, played decently, but you know I, I think there are, are bigger heights to which they'll get to this year. Um, I would say Barriel played extremely well, um, had an assist. Um, I thought Sergio Santos scoring was interesting. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to think of that one because like Brenner's not there yet. Uh, he came in. Uh, Brenner, oh, he, that's right. Brenner he's, came he's in back. for him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. He is back. Um, so he's back. Vasquez started. It'll be interesting to see how long that lasts. That pairing. You and I talked about this. How long does that that pairing up top last? I think it could be the most potent attack in the league. Question mark. I don't know. Like I don't know how people are feeling about it. Second year. Is it going to have the same kind of potent uh, output that it had? Uh, in last season. So uh, I think Lucho Acosta is again, uh, the talisman. He's the one that's going to create, he's the one that's going to lead this team um, in that central midfield. Uh, I think him creating for Brandon Vasquez and Brenner are going to be important. Um, But yeah, no, I I thought they looked good. Houston's really bad. So it's kind of hard to tell if you, I kind of wish Cincinnati would have throttled them, but they didn't really. Um, And so I guess we'll see how they do against Orlando because they're coming down here uh, this weekend. So uh, but man, I, I there's just so much to like about this attack, right? Like there's just so much going on with this attacking front three, whatever it's going to be called. So, all right, let's jump over to Miami hosting Montreal. They win this one two nil. Uh, Kirstov uh, scores in the first uh, in the forty first minute, sorry, and then uh, Borgelin in the seventy sixth minute. Montreal outpossessed them fifty five to forty four. Plus some change. They always, they, they, I'm not rounding these, but it's 55.8 to 44.2. But Miami had more shots, 18 to 14, and more shots on goals, seven to six, and ended up having two goals to nil. So 
worked out pretty well for Miami, who kind of get the start they needed to, and Montreal with the new look. Um, don't. But they're kind of exactly what we expected. Yeah, still a big question mark. I just don't know what they're going to be, if they are going to be anything. Um, I'm looking at their starting 11, Jordan, and I'm like trying to figure out. Uh, I've got Wanyama, Kyoto, Piet, Aaron Herrera, Camacho, and Miller, Apollinen. Okay, so like there's guys you recognize, but nothing jumps off of the paper at me as far as who's going to get all these goals besides from El Kyoto. And that's your boy, yeah. right? My boy. Um, your boy. Uh, Wanyama was done last year. Don't know why he came back. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I think just Montreal's a big question mark. Uh, Miami was actually uh, missing Campana. He wasn't playing. He was hurt and he's dealing mm-hmm. with some injury um, news, which is not great for Miami. I think that's something to be concerned about. Joseph Martinez, there was a couple Jordan that he was dangerously close to getting a goal. Um, I thought he was going to grab one, um, ends up not getting uh, a debut goal. Uh, but I think look pretty spry. If he can stay healthy again, I think that's a big question mark. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, Miami, they're good, but they I feel like they're missing something, right? Like a like an Argentinian like winger is what they're missing. And I can't place my finger on Oh, that's right. Lionel Messi. That's what they're missing. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if they'll... Uh, I think he'll be... We'll see. We'll see if he comes in the midfield or what, what they have him doing. Um, let's move over to Dallas, who disappointed me anyway, because I had Dallas as a pretty good team this year. They end up losing to Minnesota 1-0 off a Mender Garcia goal in the 48th minute. Uh, Dallas outpossessed them 62 to like 38. They had more shots, 11-8, but shots on goal, 1-4. to four. And uh, could not really do anything against this Minnesota team. And Minnesota somehow got the road win on a season where people are putting them pretty last. I'm sure Adrian Heath used MLS.com, as he likes to call it, as motivation against uh, for, for the locker room. So, yeah. Uh, Good win for Minnesota to be away from home and and take that win against Dallas. Uh, Dallas needs to wake up and and start getting going because I had uh, them in second place. Yeah, it's not looking for my golden. It's not looking good for my golden boot pick in uh, Jesus Ferreira. Um, Yeah, I heard he was mostly absent. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, Which you know, I I don't know why I did that because I I kind of am pretty Me down either. on him in the U.S. Men's <laughs> national team. <laughs> Jordan's like, I, I was just going off the wall uh, for the pick. But, yeah, their whole front line, Jordan, was pretty much non-existent. Areola wasn't great. Velasco didn't play well. Ferreira looked like he didn't want any kind of part of a goal. Pax and um was in. Um, I don't think he played very well. Sebastian Legette looked like he was uh, legit, legit, legitimately done. I uh, couldn't speak there. Um but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I their defense looked decent. Yeah, there's that. Um, but I, I think that Minnesota to beat Dallas without Reynoso, I mean Reynoso, um, was really important uh, for them. Kind of a what do you call those uh, victories that uh, what I can't even think of what they're what it's called. Help me. Uh, it's when you have one of those victories that's good for your morale. What this is it called? I don't know, a morale booster? <laughs> I guess, yeah. I guess it's a morale booster. I don't know what to call it. It's uh, There's something else I'm looking for. Uh, words are hard. It's only uh, 9 o'clock. Um, not even. But, yeah, no. I, I think, Jordan, they look good. Uh, but I still think that it, without Reynoso, you kind of see it where I think the attack at times is just going to stymie and, and not play as well. Um, so I, I'm kind of interested to see what happens with them. But huge disappointing loss for Dallas. Like, Massive. Yeah, at home. They outshot them and all that. Good. They just couldn't really get anything on target. Um, let's jump to another disappointment. Vancouver had a lead in the 24th minute from Brown, who scored. And then RSL, both in the 70th and 70th minute, Glad and Krylik scoring to make it 2-1. And they ended up winning. Vancouver had more possession. They had more shots, 18-11. to but the shots on goal were tied 7-7. And, you know, RSL got let back into the game 
and they took it and they won it and that's great and their beehive kit looked really cool and they were looking sharp i don't know i i think rsl might be okay it, but vancouver is kind of in the same state that they've been in for the last 10 years not really going anywhere yeah i i mean again when you look at teams nothing really excites you you kind of hope that brian white has a better season than he did last year um so far not so good uh and again it's just one game so it's kind of like we're overreacting to every single thing that's happened basically saying, oh, well, hey, didn't score. That's not good. Um, yeah. It's one game in the season. But, Jordan, there's remnants of, like, what they struggle with, right? They struggle defensively. They, they're easily broken down. Um, they go and add Takaka, or I think – I don't know how to say his name. I'm going to have to learn how to say their goalkeeper's name. Um, but the, the Japanese goalkeeper that they brought over, one of the top goalkeepers, I don't think it's going to show as well because their defense isn't very good. So I don't think that that aspect matters too much. I think you can add as many goalkeepers as you want. They could be top caliber. If you had a really bad defense in front of Andre Blake, Andre Blake would not be as good as Andre Blake is. So it, it is amazing to think that Vancouver identifies issues that they have and they're never really solved because they're, they're looking at the wrong things. And I think, Part of their issue is they're not going to be able to create goals. They're not going to be able to put away chances. I don't think Brian White's the answer. I don't know who the answer is. Their DP player they bring over is Diver Caicedo, and Caicedo has not really been that player that everybody thought he was going to be in this league. So he's really struggled. And on the flip side, RSL, they just I just feel like they know how to win. Like it's so different. Like Vancouver could be RSL if they wanted. You know what I mean? Like but they, they could know how to win out. when I'm not there. That's true. It's, it's, yeah. it's thing. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think Savarino played really well, which is really cool to see. Um, I think that RSL is looking forward to him being a contributing factor this year and really playing well. Demir Krylock is back, Jordan, and scored and looked great. Uh, I, I thought he looked very healthy. Um, I was kind of worried that if he took a step back or wasn't quite healthy 100% that this team could really struggle. Um, I wish that they had a better goal scorer. Like, I wish they had, like, a top goal scorer in the league. Um, I just don't think they do uh, in and amongst their ranks. Um, Rubio, Rubio Rubin's out. I think he was suspended because he was a, a let's over red card or something like that. Mm. Um, but he's not he's not anything that I would be like, oh, yeah, that's going to solve all of your issues. Uh, and I don't think Julio either, is either. So, again, they're looking for somebody to score. They just don't have that, I don't think, unless Demir Krylock's going to score like crazy. What I worry about Vancouver – is it just seems like the funding isn't there, right? And no, it's it, not. Yeah, it's and it, not. it sucks because this is a storied franchise, right? Like this is they were around before MLS. This is a team that's been around since 1973. Yeah. They were in the NASL. Uh, they've lasted ever since. They they have roots in this city of Vancouver, and they're not doing anything with it. While you have Seattle and Portland, the other uh, Cascadia teams who have come in and won MLS Cups that have been competitive, that have put money into the teams. And this team is in the same, I'm not lying, in the same stage, spinning their tires for the last 10 or more years at this point because they they never go anywhere. And, and it sucks because I feel sorry for Whitecaps fans that deserve so much more. You know, uh, they finished ninth in the Western Conference. That would be a playoff spot this year, of course, but it's kind of been a consistent thing where they just keep missing playoffs. Um, I know we looked at it in our preview the last time they were in it, and I totally forget when it was. I'm trying to find that now. Last time they were in the playoffs, 2021. All right, not bad, but they got bumped out in round one. Okay. They stuck they finished, in that year, too. Like it wasn't like they, they finished six yeah. in, in the West. But when you look at 2020, they finished ninth. All right. 2019, 12th. 2018, eighth. They're just always kind of around the bottom of the West. And it sucks because, uh, one, I think their jerseys are amazing. I love the color scheme of the yeah. white caps. I love their stadium, too. <laughs> their stadium, BC Place. You know, I just was watching The Flash and I filmed in Vancouver, and uh, they were inside of the stadium doing stuff. So, I mean, there's, it's in FIFA, right? They're one of the stadiums in FIFA. Right. But it, it's better. kind of just – it just kind of sucks that they're not able to get it going. And I, I think it has to be ownership because I can't 
like point the finger at anything else because you're talking about their DPs being Caicedo and, you know, bringing him in. Yeah. Okay. They need more though, right? Like they they need to go out and get actual starting strikers. They need to go out and get players in the defense. And when you see some of these teams, like even Philly grabbing a player from Montreal, like Joaquin Torres, or you see St. Louis going out and getting Tim Parker moves like that, that should be like a slam dunk for Vancouver to go out and make, but I don't know. It, it sucks. Jordan, their owner. He can't keep getting away with it. He can't keep getting away with it. He won't. Except he will. And has been <laughs> for years. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on to the last game that we have to talk about. Seattle destroying the Rapids. Talk about not scoring. Colorado did not oh. score in this match. Finished 4-0. And Logan, they are one of only three, uh, no, four teams, five teams to not score this weekend. The other teams that didn't score, NYCFC, Charlotte, Montreal, Red Bulls, Dallas, and Colorado. But uh, Christian Roldan, 25th minute, score. Jordan Morris, 45th minute, score. Hey Bear, 53rd minute, score. Hey Bear coming in and immediately scoring in his first uh, MLS game was huge. Uh, Jordan Morris scoring again in the 83rd minute. I mean, this team looked like they were their old selves again. This is without Raul Ruiz Diaz. You know, this is with Jao Paulo just coming back from injury. He was at the Club World Cup, but he's now back for MLS as well. I don't know. I, I feel pretty good about Seattle. We're talking about overreactions. I'm, my overreaction is they're back. Seattle is back. Where did we put them? I was a little... We both put them fourth, you know, because we didn't want to say they were back without seeing them back. But I, I'm starting to think that it can't have all been the Rapids were that bad. I think it was kind of a both situation. The Rapids were bad, but Seattle was really dominant. I think if it was just that the Rapids were bad, it's probably a 2-0 Seattle win. But a 4-0, I can't just be like, it was all Rapids being bad. Some of it has to be that the Sounders were good. Yeah, I mean, you you look at their roster, right? And uh, so much success in this league has come from some of these players. But, like, they're still having continued success, even at uh, the ripe old ages of 30-something, right? Um, They're all mostly in their 30s at this point. Or if not, they have knees like they're in their 30s. So I want to say, too, when I saw Jordan Morris, he looked faster than he he did. did. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. I I thought he was getting some of his speed back or something. Speed, and I thought Jordan... Decision-making? yeah. I know that they played um, in the Concacaf or the Club World Cup, and I know they've had, I think, more like a month extra. But they their passing was just so crisp that's true. Yesterday. Like, that's true. You know, I think the announce. I think Steve Zakawani on the radio feed said sort of the same thing, but he didn't really mention the the Club World Cup. But that's a good point because he was saying about how it didn't seem like a first week for them, uh, that they were passing. It was kind of going back and forth for a bit. So. I, but you pointed out, yeah, they, they had a couple more weeks, I think. And even if they didn't have, I think they actually started preseason at the same time, but they played a yeah, competitive actual yeah. match, right? They played a real competitive match, which I think helps them. Yeah, but I mean, just look at look at the lineup. New who was phenomenal, I thought, uh, deserves man of the match. I don't know who won man of the match. I wasn't paying attention to that much. Um, I'm assuming uh, Roldan or a bear won, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, but you look up and down the, the roster yesterday, Nico Ladero looked like he'd gone back in time too and found whatever he was uh, playing. Um, I, I Everything about this team, Joao Paulo looked fantastic in that defensive midfield. Uh, Rusnak looked really good, kind of getting used to being back in that kind of space with Ladero and Roldan. I think that's where he struggles is he was so used to being that guy in RSL that when he comes over and he's playing for Seattle – there's so many guys that occupy that kind of same space, do the same things, are the creators, are the guys that this attacking front has kind of been centered around for so long that Albert didn't really have the chance to kind of get accustomed to that. But, man, he looked great. Jack Reagan looked great. I mean, it, it just up and down. This team just looked – like it really did look like the Rapids were one of the worst teams in the league last night because that's how bad Seattle made them look. And 
when you play at Lumen Field and you play like that, you're never going to win. So uh, this was a fantastic performance. Overreaction, Jordan, this team is looking like the top team in the E or the West um, and potentially uh, a contender. And we had them sitting fourth because I think we were just concerned they can't stay healthy. That's kind of where we see it falling apart this year. Possession was pretty even, 50.7 to 49.3. That's wild to me. Shots on goal, uh, shots were 15 to 10, but shots on goal, 9 to 2. Rapids only getting two shots on goal. Uh, Not so bad that they were the away team. Two shots on goal for Alston at home, not great. But uh, no, the Rapids just couldn't produce enough. Like They had 10 shots, which is only five less than Seattle, but they had seven less on goal, which is... uh, not great but that is the end of the games that have played yet in about an hour and a half we are going to be getting portland skc kicking off which i'm really excited for that one i'm like foaming at the mouth for that and then uh you know we don't have any midweek games we'll be back midweek to preview next week uh the next weekend games and uh, one thing I also want to know, I, don't, I know people were complaining about kickoff times. And I think all the games that were Apple exclusive, I'll say it this way, were about five to nine minutes after the scheduled kickoff time, which is not bad. I'll take that. I'll take a little late. But the games that were on Fox were both 25 minutes. 25 minutes after the um, scheduled time. And I think that's because they were on linear TV is, is my thought there. Thoughts on Apple TV and season pass. We kind of talked about that at the beginning of the show, but I'll just give you some quick rundown uh, for the fan that commented here is we, I think we're big, we're big proponents of of season pass. Um, For me, having it all in one spot, no blackouts, the quality was there, the picture quality I really liked the radio broadcast option. I talked about that a lot at the beginning of the show. I won't really repeat it that much, but I really liked that and how seamless it was. Uh, I'm I'm just really excited for this season in particular because I think this is everything I ever wanted. Let's not even talk about games. It's got classic MLS games, every MLS Cup, every All-Star game, and... You can even watch little previews of the team preparing for the next matchup. You know, like some sort of insight. For, like Phillies was from their local channel. And it had like Shane and Williams, uh, Sebastian Latou, you know, and they were talking about looking ahead at the crew. So you're going to have that stuff too. I watched Nashville's uh, about them. They had a really good one about preparing for NYCFC. So you have like, it was like five minutes. They have really nice little things. Uh, as well so hopefully that continues to grow what i really want is hopefully next off season they're filming like a hard knocks type thing as we get through the season or something like that that's that's what I, that's my biggest one i'll agree with you on that and covering this whole league uh apple tv plus uh and mls season pass have made this so much easier for us like it it really has like i was watching i think it's like the wrap-up or something like that uh where they do basically a recap of the the games from the day prior and it's great like it's so good because it's it's weeby it was taylor twelman nigel and then julia sakovitz um and they were just talking about each of the games and like throwing in some commentary in between each goal and stuff like that. You get a good perspective from what Taylor thinks, what Andrew thinks, what Julie thinks. Like, I, I love that. And I, I think that that's got a lot of room to grow too because they'll get some chemistry back and forth. It felt like baseball tonight when they would do like the rundown. Like, uh, like Yes, that was the thing that was on till 1.30. That yeah, was great. It was beautiful, but I, I loved it. I, I loved it. I love this product. If you haven't gotten it and you're thinking about it and you're on the fence, jump over it because I think it's totally worth it if you're an MLS fan. At least give this season a try, right? If you're still on the fence, uh, next episode we will be sharing what free games are going to be on next week as well. So uh, all you need is the app. Just download the app of Apple TV and you would have access to these free games. You don't even need Apple TV Plus, just Apple TV. So next next week, we'll preview what 
those games will be on the weekend or in you know like midweek we'll, we'll talk about what games are going to be free I, i'll have a graphic i share on the twitter and instagram as well for free games each week i'm going to continue making those i already have the next few made like i just if you want to know ahead of time it's on their mlssoccer.com schedule it'll tell you where you can watch it and it'll say if it's a free game or not so you can even plan ahead like that but i'm pumped i'm pumped for the season i thought it was great you, you can't ask for anything better than no draws to start off the season for all the fans that say soccer's boring because they tie uh guess what they didn't tie this this week so there you go but i i don't know I, i'm really excited that I, I mean like i said portland skc is coming up in a few minutes i'm really excited about that game uh, I think that has potential to be a really fun matchup. Here's some other stuff that's coming down the line. Logan has his Orlando podcast. We talked about that. He put up, a, if you want a deeper dive into the Orlando game than what he just shared, that's up on. Uh, drop the name of it, Logan. Yeah, so it's City Beautiful SC in Orlando City podcast. There it is. If you're on YouTube, it just popped up. Wow, that was fancy. Look at that. Some production there. Whoa, it's gone. <laughs> and uh, I want to announce that my plan is when the um, USL season starts kicking off again and all that, my plan is to bring back an old show that was on the YouTube, but I'm going to put it on the podcast feed as well. It's called The Closed Pyramid. It's talking all lower league soccer in america so we won't be talking mls on that feed we'll be talking uh usl championship usl league one usl league two nisa you know all those little things they'll be me mostly i think logan might come on a few times i might try to get some guests to talk some lower league stuff to really make this you know stateside uh not just mls so we'll be uh having that launch uh, that season starts on march 11th so i'll be in florida that day so uh i guess the when the monday i come back i'll probably record my episode for the closed pyramid um because i'm off that day so probably knock that out then and get into a rhythm of adding that onto the youtube adding that onto the podcast feed maybe a separate feed too i don't know how many times i want to upload it that's a that's gonna be annoying on my end but yeah so we got a lot more stuff coming out for you uh throughout the throughout the season so just you know we'll be covering the women's world cup we'll be covering um all kinds of great uh u.s national team stuff so nations league CONCACAF Champions League. A lot of stuff coming up. So uh, if you want to contact us or reach out to us at Stateside Show on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email us statesideshow at gmail.com. If you want to give longer term feedback, you can rate us on the Apple Podcasts and Spotify, leave reviews, and that's it. So have a great rest of your week, and we'll catch you later. <laughs>